talk is on men's health and dr summers is going to present thank you good morning um, our topic this morning is men's health which as a topic had a, a bit of a quandary exactly what constitutes men's health seems like it would be everything except cervical cancer and some of the things that uh, the men can't get but you know, I started then looking into what were the, uh, you know, what constitutes men's health from an academic medicine perspective. So, first the disclosure. Um, I don't, other than being male, I don't have any conflicts of interest. <coughs> Point out that this is an R-rated talk. If you'll be offended by things like discussions of erectile dysfunction, prostates, uh, safe sex, those sorts of things, and be offended by it, then pretend your pager just went off and excuse yourself. But, is, but these will be some of the things that we'll be talking about today. And so when I was assigned this and started to look into the idea of what is men's health, um, you know, I w wasn't quite sure what are the topics, what are the things we should do. I figured, okay, well, prostates and erectile dysfunction, what else is there? So I belong to the YMCA in Kingsport. And they have on the, uh, in the magazine rack there, a magazine called Men's Health. So I thought, okay, here's gonna be a good source of information about what men's health is. So I went to the Men's Health website. So our talk today is about the super shake that helps you build muscle faster, and how to do 50 perfect push-ups, as well as some of those other things that I say that are over on the right hand side there. I decided that's probably not really what we should be talking about in men's health. So I went to the NIH sites and the ACGME sites to see what kind of topics we should be discussing today. And we're going to be talking about some much more bland sorts of things. I'm sorry. Statistics interventions that we can take to have an impact on an, our patients, and then some discussions of sexual health. And that's what we'll get into more of the erectile dysfunctions and prostates and all of the rest. So to start, men are bad people. We have bad habits. The percentage of men with an appropriate level of physical activity, just over half. I'm actually a little surprised it's that high, but, but, that's, but that's the stat. The percentage of men with five or more drinks on at least one occasion in the past year, 31%. The percentage of men over 18 who smoke, 21%. So we smoke, we drink, and we don't get exercise. We tend to be fat, hypertensive, and poor. The percentage of men over 20 who are obese, is defined by a BMI over uh, 30, is over a third. The percentage of men over 20 with hypertension is just about a third. Those numbers seem to correlate. And the percentage of men under the age of 65, when Medicare kicks in, who are uninsured is almost 20%. And that's recent data in spite of the uh, Affordable Care Act. With that, it would not be surprised that we have life expectancy issues. So the leading causes of death for men, all ages, heart disease, cancer, and accidents. We'll go into a little bit more detail on, on each of those areas. For heart disease, male sex is a non-modifiable risk factor. There have actually been studies that have looked to see if castration affects coronary disease, and it does not. It's thankfully, it's a non-modifiable risk factor. There is a two to one male to female ratio for coronary disease across cultures, so it's not just the you know, the American fast food culture that is doing this, this, this is really universal. 
So what we need to do then is to kind of focus on our modifiable risks. You know, the things that you can do. And I'm not going to go into the big list discussion on, uh, on coronary disease because you guys have plenty of lectures on, on coronary disease. But the smoking, blood pressure control, proper exercise, um, you know, weight control, diabetes, you know, all of those actual modifiable risk factors, cholesterol. So paying attention to all of those. Cancer, the second leading cause of death in men. Let's we'll spend a, a minute on this uh, table because it's kind of interesting. It talks about the risk of acquiring a particular cancer and then the risk of dying of that cancer. And you can see what we're good at and what we're not so good at. Risk of acquiring prostate cancer is one in seven. That's actually higher than the risk of breast cancer for women. So the risk of getting prostate cancer for men, one in seven. But the risk of dying of prostate cancer is one in 38. We always say that, oh, they'll get prostate cancer, it's okay, they'll die of something else. Well, not really. You know, of those who get prostate cancer, you know, one in five of those will end up uh, dying of it. So it means four or five do die of something else, but roughly one in five uh, do end up dying of the prostate cancer. Lung cancer, we're not as good at treating. We've got a risk of acquiring one in 13, and that's part of the thing about smoking. And the risk of death is one in 15. So the majority of those folks who get lung cancer end up dying. Colon cancer, we're a little better at treating. One in 21 of getting it, and one in 49 of dying from it. So our top three, prostate, lung, and colon, uh, for our risks of getting those are actually fairly high. One in seven, one in 13, one in 21. Risks of dying from them, Prostate, not quite as bad. Lung, awful. Colon, half. Some others just of interest that I threw up there, um, you know, pancreatic cancer, another bad actor that often we think of as a death sentence, you know, die rapidly from, from, from pancreatic cancer. One in 66 chance of a, of a male getting pancreatic cancer one in 74 chance of dying from it. So indeed, we don't save many. Melanoma, we're actually a little bit better at. Dr. Light, if, if he were here this morning, we could congratulate him. But uh, one in 39 chance of getting it. Remember your sunscreens. One in 233 of actually dying from it. So that's only, if you do the quick math, about one in eight of the folks who, uh, or, you know, one in six to one in eight of the folks that get melanoma actually will end up dying from it. So, so interventions, you know, cancer prevention, obviously encouraging your patients to stop smoking. The uh, for colonoscopy, making sure folks are keeping our keeping up to date on their colonoscopies. Folks who don't like getting the colonoscopies, the IFOT, uh, the immune version of the occult blood testing, um, is close in accuracy and, uh, and can be a good screen for those who absolutely refer to, refuse to do the clean out for colon cancer. Prostate's a little more interesting. The risk factors there um, race, African Americans are more likely to get prostate cancer and it's more likely to be aggressive. Age, obviously. Family history, first degree relative there, we're talking, you know, father, brothers. Um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes also increase the risk of prostate cancer. So all of those are non modifiable. The only real modifiable uh, risks for prostate cancer appear to be obesity and high saturated fat diet. 
and at the end we'll talk about one other thing that we can do to try to uh, try to prevent uh, prostate cancer. So our third cause of death. Are the last words a male under the age of 45 says before he dies. Hey fellers, watch this. Accidents. Boys are twice as likely to die of play-related accidents or falling out of windows. Interesting that these were put together um, in the stats, but the accidents, falling out of windows, then girls. Is there any Game of Thrones fans that can relate to the falling out of windows and spinal cord injuries? Um, boys are three to four times more likely to have spinal cord injuries than girls. Up to age 44, accidents are the leading cause of male death. And males are five times more likely to die from drowning. Violence. Four out of five homicide victims are men. So it's the third leading cause of death in ages one to four. So cranky two-year-old boys have a tendency to be off. Um, it is the second leading cause of death in the, in the mid-teenagers, the 15 to 19 age group, and third leading cause in 20 to 34-year-olds. Homicide is the fourth leading cause of death in African-American males, all ages put together. And it is first, it is the leading cause of death in the 15 to 24 age group. So violence is one of the things we have to be trying to counsel our patients regarding. So what interventions can we take for this risk, for this cause of death? You know, first, talking about seat belts. If you talk about seat belts with your patients when you're doing those annual exams, you're doing uh, you know, wonderful United Healthcare forms, uh, those exams for our patients, and you talk about safety in the, uh, the questions there. Make sure you're covering seat belts. It's a big impact on reducing the impact of a motor vehicle accident. Drugs and alcohol. You know, folks are more likely to die in an accident, more likely, or more likely to have an accident if they're under the influence. So going back to those early slides about uh, frequency of heavy drinking, you know that 30% of men um, having had five or more drinks in the, one time in the past year, addressing alcohol issues with your patients. Gun safety. That with the violence. Basically, you know, I'm not a, uh, a gun control person, but you do need to address uh, gun safety. This culture, there's a lot of folks with firearms. There are a lot of folks with firearms in their home. And so you need to address that they're making sure that this is that safe with them. They're, they're keeping them locked up. You know, there are things like thumbprint saves that, uh, you know, if someone wants to keep a gun by the bed, rather than rolling over and having it go off, it's probably better to have it in a little safe there that can be opened with a, by just putting your thumb on there and it reads the thumbprint. So that if you need to protect yourself, and it's actually is front page story in the Kingsport paper this morning about a uh, gentleman who heard someone breaking into his house and uh, shot him when he was halfway through the window. Well, he probably feels justified for having the gun by the bedside. But there are also those folks where there are gun safety issues where folks will have you know, accidental injuries. And so you need to make sure that folks are using gun lock, gun safes, things like that. Keep things away from kids. You know, those uh, one to four year old boys have a tendency to pick up anything and play with them. And then safe sex, which we'll go into a little more detail, but that's another major issue for, for um, interventions for, 
for males. So our first question. And the question there were questions printed on the, uh, on the sheets. These are very similar, but not exactly the same as the questions on the sheets. Um, the leading cause of death in men of all ages are accidents, heart disease, and cancer. Yeah. So some of the, the other ones, see, I printed up the, the actual stats for men all ages and some of the other ones just out of interest. Uh, stroke is number five. COPD is number four. And Alzheimer's is down at number eight as far as causes of death, men all ages. So now the special topics. We're talking about erectile dysfunction, safe sex, and prostates. For erectile dysfunction, first thing, of course, is to take a proper history. You know, consider what the causes are. You know, stress, stability of the relationship, you know, other medical conditions, hypertension, diabetes being uh, leading causes of erectile dysfunction. Medications, the medications to treat those conditions, in particular antihypertensives, have a tendency to, uh, to affect the ability to achieve or maintain erections. Hormone levels, from the testosterone levels. Depression, alcohol use, Alcohol tends to increase the drive, but decrease the performance. Obesity, probably due to uh, shifts in hormones. Self-image, smoking, and you know, really other things, performance anxiety. That actually leads, that's up there in that stress part. Um, there's an old joke about uh, what's the difference between fear and terror. Fear is the first time that you can't do it the second time, and terror is the second time you can't do it the first time. So with that, uh, you know, performance anxiety can impair the ability to, to achieve an erection. Treatments, we tend to jump to near the bottom there, to the, to the PDE5 inhibitors. But we should talk about some of the other options. Implants. Implants are probably the only thing up there that have a 100% success rate. So they've, you know, essentially, many of them are now essentially inflatable. Um, you push a button and fluid flows into the, uh, into the implant, causing the erection push another button, it goes back down. So they have, you know, a very, and they have a very high success rate, you know, virtually 100%. Pumps. The way that a person uses a pump is that it's a vacuum device. These are actually covered by Medicare. Um, essentially, the person fits it over the penis applies vacuum either electrically or by a hand pump. When the uh, erection occurs, then put a ring around the base of the penis to keep the blood in the penis and ready to go from there. So implants, pumps, alprostadil, something that we don't think of as much because of the way it's administered. There are two different ways that it can be given. Um, Caverject, which is an injection into the, uh, the cavernosa, basically injecting into the base of the penis to cause an erection. That's got a low patient acceptability rate compared to some of the other things. But, uh, but that works. The other is urethral suppository, though. Uh, the MUSE system, M-U-S-E, uh, uses L-prostadil, um, placed inside the urethral meatus, and be, it's absorbed and causes an erection, and has a pretty good success rate with that. Uh, 
the patients that the patients that I have who do this call it muzzle loading. But it's uh, essentially a way of to to get an erection also on call. Then Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, which are the PDE5 in inhibitors, they work for the majority of patients. Those things can vary. They are very expensive. Currently, they're up around $25 a pill at this point. There are variations. All of them have the potential for causing blindness. All of them have the potential for causing hearing loss. These can be transient or permanent. It is fairly common for Viagra to cause a blue tinging to the vision that is different from the blindness that can occur. Um, for that reason, they say airline pilots and folks who, where color is, a very, is important should not use Viagra for a couple of days before, before they're flying or doing, the, the, doing their jobs. The kinetics of the three are different. Viagra and Levitra are close as far as their activity. Um, both take about half an hour to an hour to become effective and are good for about four to six hours. The Viagra about four, Levitra about six hours uh, where it's effective. Cialis is a little bit quicker actually. It's 15 to 30 minutes and has a duration of action of about 36 hours. Not been studied to see whether it works for multiple events during that 36 hours, but it would make sense, but it hasn't been studied that way. In Europe, it's sometimes called the weekender because of that. So, so, the, uh, so those, and then yohimbine is a Mexican root that was, uh, you can sometimes get it at some of the health food places, but it, Yocon is an older brand. Essentially, it's a, another medication that has barely better than placebo uh, benefits. But considering the effect that stress and some of the other things can have on erectile dysfunction, placebos can work. So, Yohimbine is relatively. Um, you know, it doesn't have a lot of side effects. It is another option for folks that can't afford the, the, the PDE5 kind of inhibitors. So, 60-year-old male had transient blindness from sildenafil, which is Viagra. He still wants something for erectile dysfunction. You would recommend... That's the uh, the Caverject or um, you know or Muse system. So then, safe sex. Not going to go into the proper use of condoms and that sort of thing. That's more of a health class kind of a uh, topic. But making sure that the person is choosing wisely. Are they going to bars and picking up people? you know, and have a random intercourse, you know, things to try to discuss about the risks that are involved, and sure that they are choosing wisely. The second one was a uh, bus campaign in New York about 15 years ago, and, uh, but I thought it was cute. Um, be positive, you are negative. And this is encouraging HIV screening. And of course, Barrier methods. Barriers reduce the risk of pregnancy and reduce the risk of transmission of sexually transmitted diseases by about one in ten. So, if your risk without it would be, you know, so it depends on what disease we're talking about, but say, you know, like in HIV, uh, one in 600 becomes one in 6,000. So, you know, significantly reduces the risks, though it certainly does not eliminate them. Okay. Probably the most controversial topic that we covered today is PSAs. The, the feds 
basically are currently referring folks to American Urological Association and their guidelines with regards to recommendations about PSAs. And so there's several points in this. Let's kind of go out over them in, in detail. First point in their guideline is that they recommend against screening in men under 40. Okay, low prevalence of disease, so under 40, just don't do it. Second, panel does not recommend routine screening in men between 40 and 54 at average risk. This is admittedly a C recommendation. They don't have enough data to really say things for certainty. But the idea being that for men who are younger than 55 and at higher risk, positive family history, and again, we're talking about father or brothers, um, and, and also African Americans, the decisions regarding cancer screening should be individualized in those groups. And the, the issues with PSA are probably the false positives are the ones we worry about more than the false negatives. False negatives wouldn't have picked up the problem anyway. With false positives, we can cause harm. You know, with doing the PSAs, repeating that, doing then prostate biopsy, you know, there's a few percentage of folks that will have serious infections related to a prostate biopsy that will require hospitalization. I think the rate is about 4%. So that's high. Third guideline for men 55 to 69. So now we're, we're moving into the, the next range. Panel recognizes the decision to undergo the PSA screening involves weighing the benefits of preventing prostate cancer mortality in one for every thousand screened over a decade against the known potential harms of screening and treatment. Because the other part of this is that some prostate cancers are not aggressive. And what we were talking about early on, that not all men who get prostate cancer will die of the prostate cancer. So when you do a prostatectomy and you leave the person with erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence, and all of those complications from the treatment, followed by radiation, issues with infections, all of the things that can go into that, and you're not actually affecting mortality. That's a concern. And honestly, we don't have enough statistics to answer all of that. But we've moved away from the idea that detecting cancer is good, you know, and therefore, you know, PSAs should be done on everybody. We've moved away from that. But so they, they recommend shared decision making for men aged 60, 55 to 69 that are considering PSA and proceeding based on the man's values and preferences. And that would add a little by saying that it's something to be discussed, that's actually then a B recommendation. And basically, the greatest uh, benefits for screening appear to be in that age because that's when you're going to pick up. A cancer that might, you know, if someone gets prostate cancer, even if it's not terribly aggressive and they're 55 years old, then you have a, a better impact on saving life down the road than if you're testing the person at. Next, to reduce the harms in screening, catch up myself. Routine screening interval of two years or more may be preferred over the annual screening in those men who have, who have participated in shared decision making and decided on screening. So if the numbers aren't bad first time, then, you know, and it says additionally intervals for rescreening can be individualized by baseline PSA. So the numbers aren't bad to begin with, then think about if they want to continue the screening doing it a little less often. You're then a little less likely to end up with, the, um, with those false positives, with the bumps, the 
to make you nervous when you start to see that the PSA went from 1.7 to 2.5 a year later. Yeah. In PSA velocity, the cutoff is 0.75 per year. That's what the urologist will look at is, uh, you know, a rise of PSA uh, besides the absolute value. Um, you know, PSA is supposed to be under 4. Um, of rise of more than 0.75 per year is also considered to be worrisome. Um, panel does not recommend routine PSA screening in men over 70 or any man with less than 10 to 15 year life expectancy. Same issue with colonoscopies. Someone's got a life expectancy of less than 10 years, you don't do a colonoscopy. Last. Um, basically, we started off with a uh, website, and this there was the Men's Health website. This is a little more um, medically oriented website. This is Medscape, and this looking for uh, men's health issues on Medscape. Basically, the uh, although I'm not really going to address that uh, issue about the size of the donor pool for penis transplants. Um, actually, the reason that I brought this in is best evidence yet ejaculation reduces prostate cancer risk. So we're talking about the things that you can do to reduce prostate cancer risk, a low-fat diet, avoiding obesity, but also that. <laughs> I warned you this was an R-rated one. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> Dr. Stewart. on prostate cancer, but also on offspring. If you start to track it through, then you have to consider, you know, the, the female offspring as well. But, but yes, with men, uh, prostate cancer risk is increased with BRCA1 and BRCA2 and should be covered, is not. Yeah, the, uh, the question was, what about the recommendations for digital rectal exam? Um, several indications. One is if the person has any symptoms. You know, you're checking for BPH, looking for nodules, like that. Um, AHRQ, I don't think is recommending the, uh, double check it, but I don't think AHRQ is recommending digital rectal exam for prostate screening at this point. But if the person has any symptoms, then you want to do it. Or if they're high risk, you know, if they fall into one of those high risk groups, then you want to do it. If they have an elevated PSA, that should be followed. And if there's any question about prostatitis, which is one of the leading causes of, uh, of a false positive PSA, it's going to be prostatitis, either acute or chronic. Chronic being far more common than acute prostatitis. Other questions? Goes up 
because it's getting picked up at that point. Yeah, indeed. Um, one of the first patients that I had moving to this area uh, was a gentleman. He was known diabetic, but his doctor retired. He says that his doctor said, oh, just watch what you're eating and, uh, and don't bother. Ten years later, come, presents to the emergency room with a diabetic foot infection, ends up with an above-the-knee amputation. Um, you know, and, you know, people presenting at that point um, because of not taking care of themselves and going to the doctor. And, you know, and part of that comes from that 18% of males under the age of 65 who are uninsured. Other questions? It's... <laughs> Give them the list of tools that we have available. Um, you know, if they're willing to do cold turkey, they probably aren't asking you for it, something. So uh, the, that, that certainly works for some folks. All of the different medications and things that we can do, all of the mechanisms have about the same success rate. So it really becomes a patient preference thing. I had a patient yesterday who was asking me about uh, smoking cessation. Basically, I took a history of when it is that she smokes. You know, if you have someone who smokes every hour on the hour, that's someone who's got a, who likes to maintain a nicotine level, and that person is probably going to benefit from the patches. She did not. She tended to smoke first thing in the morning and then in the evening. She might get by with the gum, the nicotine gum. And then there are the other options, um, you know, the Chantix, which works about as often as the other things, has um, side effects of depression is the thing that scares folks. It scares some of my patients. But Chantix works. And, of course, uh, bupropiot. Um, Zyban was the uh, brand used for uh, quitting smoking, but uh, you know, that's, that's another option for folks. So for me, I lay it all out on the table, say, here are the options, here are what we have available, and what do you think will work for you? Because getting them the patient, when the patient is involved in the decision, you're getting more patient buy-in, and hopefully higher success then. Right. There's not a lot of data. It would make sense that not having the nicotine and that would be helpful. And if it's mainly water droplets that are in the, the vapor for the e-cigarettes, then that shouldn't be harmful. However, those, uh, the, it's not just water droplets. There are fine particles in, in the e-cigarettes in that smoke so to speak. And it's felt that the, the fine particles are tending to be what causes a lot of the problems with emphysema. And so, you know, I think you would see, you know, again, there's not the studies because this hasn't been around for the kind of time that is needed to get the long-term longitudinal studies to show effect. Um, the, the New England Journal article couple of months ago talking about the e-cigarettes and risks associated. But, you know, but it, what would make some common sense would be that it would not increase the risk of heart disease because there's no nicotine, but may still carry with it some risk as far as COPD, although probably less than tobacco products, less than smoking. That's probably. <laughs> the question was uh, whether 
digital rectal exam can falsely elevate the PSA levels. That's been an area of d debate. Um, I think, you know, there's not good data to show that it does. However, if you ask a urologist, they'll want the person to get the PSA away from the time of a digital rectal exam. And also, um, so ejaculation can reduce the risk of prostate cancer long term from the couple of studies that are out now. It also tends to increase the PSA levels. So a person should be, you know, if they've got more borderline values, they should be counseled not to engage in activity um, for 48 hours before having the blood drawn. Anything else? Okay, good, thanks.